G'day YouTubers, it's time for another episode on Northern Morden Bay. In this episode I'm going to try and cover the area from Cowan, which I think is about as far north as we got before, up through Bulwa and to Kombiore Point. As usual, how far I get depends on how much I waffle on. I've gone into some of the history of the area again, but I've also added some shots that just show the atmosphere of the times, going back to the early 1900s. They're not actually history, but I found them fascinating. If that's not your thing, down in the video description there's the chapters in this. You can go down there and just click on the links and that will skip over these parts for you. There's also links to some of the historical sites that I found this information on. If you are interested in the raw history of it, go and have a read of these sites. They're quite fascinating. In the last couple of videos I covered cow and cow and history around there and then I covered the curtain artificial reef in what I think is fairly good detail. In this video I'm going to take us north of there and continue on up through Bulwa and to Comburo Point and maybe just a little bit beyond as well. I'll just start with a little bit of the history of Bulwa. The settlement was established when they moved the pilot station from Amity up to Bulwa the government decided to make that move after a ship went down on the South Passage Bar with a cost, I think, of 44 lives. In the mid-1800s, they moved the pilot station from Amity up to Bulwa and mandated that all ships go around the north of Morton Island to enter Morton Bay. As you can see, by 1899, there was quite a little community built up around the pilot station. As the community grew bigger, of course, there was kids came along and they required a school. From what I can tell, the first school was a private school. The residents must have organised that themselves. But later on, the government took over and established a state school there. I always do the gentlemanly thing and carry my wife off the boat in winter when the water's a bit cold. But these girls get to walk the plank, so they don't even get their feet wet whether it's hot or cold. That was the way they treated ladies back in the day. Camping on Morton Island has always been a bit of a thing and this picture from 1907 proves the point. However, I stuck it in just to illustrate how uncomfortable camping must have been back in the day, wearing those long dresses and getting dressed up in your vest, of all things. It's just not camping gear. The Queensland State Archives has a lot of pictures of the history around Morton Bay and it's really fascinating to look through them. But one thing they all have in common is the serious poses that these people used to strike in these days just to get their picture taken. There was no spontaneity at all. And I guess that comes a little bit hard given the camera gear that they had back in the day. It took time to set up. During the early 1930s, three ships were scuttled off Bulwa the Catalina, the Mount Kembla and the Hopewell. The idea was to form a breakwater The small boats could anchor in behind and be in calm water. A little safe harbour if you will. And it didn't take very long before the harbour was taken advantage of. And you can see in this picture a party has anchored up there and is having a picnic on the beach. Of course wherever there's wrecks there's fish and it didn't take long before the wrecks became a fishing spot for anyone that was on the island. In fact, the personnel that was stationed at RAN7 often went down to fish off the wrecks and catch something to eat. That practice continued after the war. However, the wrecks are slowly rusting away and eventually they'll only be a memory. I always find it very sad to see a ship rusting away on the shore. It's different if it's underwater. Apart from the fact that it's out of sight, it's really different if you dive on it and see it down underwater. I think it takes a bit longer for them to rust away underwater because they're not exposed to the same amount of oxygen. In any event, it's sad to see and I'll just leave these pictures play through for a few more seconds before we continue on. Here's a couple of shots of Bulwar from the air. You can see the township nestled in there behind the trees. It's not very far from a really, really beautiful beach. I know Tangaluma further south gets all the visitors, but Bulwar is certainly worth calling in and having a look. And of course, there's accommodation in Bulwar if you want to stay on the island. You can arrive by boat or take the ferry over with your car. 
and stay at Bulwara and enjoy the facility. And while we're on the subject of facilities there, there's Castaways. It's a general store, come takeaway, come restaurant, and anything you need is probably at Castaways. They pride themselves on having a wide range of things to meet the needs of holiday makers and boaties. So if you're camping on your boat and you need some supplies, just call into Castaways, they've probably got them. This is an area that I don't have many marks for. I've got a couple, one marks a special area, one marks a general area. It's an area where you just sound around along the drop off and if you see signs of fish on your sounder, you stop and have a fish. They're not going to be in the same spot twice, or at least I haven't found them to be so, but you can generally find them somewhere along the drop off. Of course, there's the marks for the wrecks themselves. Once you get in the general area, there's no trouble seeing them, but if you want a point on your map to head for, this is it. Now here's some information on the wrecks themselves. If you're interested, you can pause the video and have a read. It's just in the program that I use to manage my marks and tracks. It has an area that I can put comments in and pictures in. I usually use it for sounder shots of what I see on the bottom these days and comments about fish I catch and things like that, tides, temperatures, all the rest of it. But in this case, I've just put in the information of the wrecks just because I find it fascinating. There's a mark there that I've named Bulwa Bait. As with all marks, it's just a mark in a general area. You can't go up to that mark and drop your line over and expect to pull up some bait. There's weed beds in the area of Bulwa, and at the right time of year you'll get squid there, so take a squid jig. There's also bait schools around, so take your sabiki and try that out. As with all bait spots that I know of, you can't guarantee that you're going to go there and get some bait on any particular day. So I always buy some good quality bait off Mr. Bait to take with me, just in case I don't have any luck catching libies. But this is an area that you can go and have a hunt around, just try your luck. As I say, can't guarantee it, but if you can catch libies, you'll have a lot better luck at fishing. And while we're on the subject of bait, always keep your eyes open. Not that long ago, my wife was with me and we pulled into Lucinda Bay to have lunch and I noticed that there were some schools of bait swimming around the boat. So I dropped the sabiki rig over and caught a haul of liveys. You just never can tell. Another time recently I was hauling down the Rouse Channel doing about 20 odd knots and next thing I saw this bird dive into the water right near me. It wasn't very far, maybe 10, 15 metres away from the boat. Quite brave of him to dive in like that. But I looked at the sonar, mainly to see if I could see him on the sonar, but what I did see was a big skill of bait. So I chopped the throttle, turned around, went back and caught some of them. Now these other two marks are very close together and I expect they're both marking the same structure that I've marked at different times. I don't have any screenshots from that trip to show what I marked, but given the fact that I've marked one with that orange tower, I expect that that's a rather large hill there. And that's not a bad place to fish around, if that's correct. And if it's not correct, I can tell you there is a rather large hill around that area. You can't miss it if you find it on the sounder. And again, it's not a bad spot. As I said, there's a lot of fishing opportunities along this area, right along the Bulwar drop off the ledge. I don't have marks for it because you won't find the fish in the same spot twice, or at least I never have. However, I have got some bathymetry of the area and we'll have a close look at that in a little bit. And that brings us to Combiore Point. The first lighthouse was erected at Combiore Point in 1863 and in those days they used kerosene burners to make the light. It's had quite a chequered history. It was replaced in 1867, so only after four years they replaced it with a wooden tower. A taller wooden tower was erected in 1874 and again in 1877. There's a listing from 1909 that describes the tower as carrying a fourth order dioptric apparatus which was visible for 9 nautical miles or 17 kilometres, 10 statute miles. That makes me question the fact that some of these pictures depict a tower made of bricks. I think that some of these pictures that are purport to be the Combiuro Tower Lighthouse are actually the Cape Morton Lighthouse. Not sure of that, but just the feeling I get from what I've read about the lighthouses. And just an interesting side note on that, 
In spite of hundreds of years ago, people learning the hard way that they had to move things that were built too close to the ocean, we still build right on top of the ocean and then wonder why it erodes. In fact, the erosion didn't stop back then. The lighthouse was discontinued in 1960 because of erosion and later that year it collapsed into the sea. Prior to that, in 1954, the light had been converted to acetylene gas and automated and demanded. During the war, RAN7 operated at Conbure Point and that was responsible for monitoring, maintaining and operating the minefields in the northern end of Morton Bay. There's quite a few good historical references giving all the details of the minefields, the operations at RAN7, the Cowan Cowan Battery, which I've already spoken about. And I'll put some references down in the video description if you want to go and have a look at those sites. I really recommend them if you're interested in the history at all. They're great references. There's a couple more shipwrecks in the area of Combiore Point, and the first one I'll speak about is the Grace Darling. That was a sailing ship that was wrecked there in 1894. There's not a lot left of it now, but there's still ballast mounds and little bits and pieces on the bottom. Being a sailing ship and being made out of wood, it is a pretty fragile area. It has deteriorated a lot over the years. I have got it marked down as a decent fishing area, but if you do want to try fishing on it, please, please don't anchor on that area. Anchor away from the wreck after you've found it on your sounder and let your boat lay back over it to fish. If you go dropping your anchor on the wreck, it won't be long before nothing's left. This is the entry from my database of waypoints and fishing marks. If you want to pause the video, you can have a read of that. It gives you all the historical details as well as whatever notes I've put down on it. The Warren Goddard was wrecked not very far away from the Grace Darling. I don't have a lot of information on this wreck and I'm not sure if it's still there. When it was wrecked, it was driven ashore, and they did try to refloat it, but they couldn't. It may have been salvaged for parts, and it may not be there anymore at all. I haven't gone looking for it specifically, but I haven't noticed the wreck on the shore in that area when I've been there. Of course, the shoreline changes all the time with erosion, so there may be something there that I just haven't seen. There's a screenshot here of the account of the wreck in my database. If you'd like to read it, just pause the video. I had hoped to get some higher resolution bathymetry to show you this area between Bulwar and Combiore Point so we could have a good clear look at the drop-offs, but I couldn't get copyright approval for it so we'll have to make do with these screenshots, they're not too bad. As I said earlier, there's no real spots apart from the one hill and one that I'll mention later that I just spotted on the bathymetry as I was making the video, but the idea is to sound along the drop off and see if you can see any sign of fish on your sounder and then just pull up and have a go. There's a lot of patches of coffee rock along this drop off and that's generally where I find the fish. So if you can tell what sort of bottom you've got on your sounder, you're a couple of points ahead of the game. Where you see some heavy rocky bottom, have a good sound around for the fish around that area. The bathymetry models I do have come with a few different shading styles with and without contour lines. So I'm just going to show a variety of them. You can pause the video and have a look at the one that you find the most meaningful. The shading's basically a personal preference. Some people find one style of shading easier to read than others. Personally, I'm not a real fan of the blue one. I do rather like the multicolored one, but the orange palette's not too bad either. Now, if you haven't gone over and fished this area before, just be aware that the tidal current can have a huge run in it. I've been over there where I've needed 16 ounces of lead to get my line down onto the bottom when I was anchored up. Now, what this means for you is that at the full run of current, your mincator may not hold you, and if you're anchoring up, you'll need a bit of extra line out to make sure your anchor doesn't drag. The maps say that the current can get up to three knots, now, I wouldn't have said that much. I would have said more like two, two and a bit, but the maps say three knots, so make your plans on that just to be on the safe side. And while three knots might not sound like very much, believe me, for a tidal current run, that is a lot. I'll just put these two shots up to finish off. This one here, Waypoint 550, is the one that I think is the underwater hill, and that's just showing you the position in relation to the ledge and bulwark. And this one here is just a little hill that I noticed on the bathymetry as I was doing the video. 
So I've dropped a mark in on it and next time I'm up there I'm going to have a sound around there and just see if it actually exists, how steep it is in real life and if there's any fish hanging around it. For the most part I've found the bathymetry I've used to suss out spots that I want to check has been pretty good. Occasionally you'll see something on the bathymetry and you'll get out there and there's nothing like it anywhere in the area. But for the most part, looking at bathymetry and whatever you can get by way of soundings saves you a lot of time hunting around in areas that just aren't productive. You can go out there to an area that you think might be productive and have a sound around and spend a lot less time looking for new spots. Well that wraps up this video, thank you for taking the time to watch it. I know I didn't give you very many marks in this video but honestly the Bulwar Ledge offers a million fishing opportunities. If you can read your sounder, sound along it. I don't think I've ever been there where I haven't found something along there. Not that I fish that area very much because it's a long way from where I normally launch but I used to get up there more when I had the big boat and had the hydro field. I used to go up around north tip of Morton and I'd often stop and fish that area as well. In the next videos we'll be moving across the bay over towards Bribey and down through Redcliffe. I expect I'll wrap up this series in another couple of videos. We'll see how that goes. Until then, good fishing.